Today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search specializes in helping small law firms in Texas hire lawyers and build great teams. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Hey everyone, Daniel here, back with you on Lone Star Lawyers. I hope you and your family are both healthy and safe. Before we get into this episode, I want to let you know that Varsity Search has been retained by a general practice firm in Arlington to help them grow their family law team. So if you value inclusivity, teamwork, diversity, humility, and cost-effective client service, and you have two years or more of family law experience, we want to hear from you. So you can email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com, or you can go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers to get more information as well as apply. All right, today we head to Longview, where our guest is Derek Gilliland. Derek is a partner at the recently formed personal injury and trial firm, Sorry Gilliland and Hull, where he focuses on trying cases and oversees the firm's intellectual property litigation practice. Now, Derek has led or played a key role on multiple eight-figure verdicts and settlements, has successfully argued at the Texas Supreme Court, and is a frequent speaker for the Texas State Bar, AIPLA, and other organizations. All right, with that, let's hop into our conversation with Derek Gilliland on today's Monday Mentors episode of Lone Star Lawyers. All right, Derek Gilliland joins us right now, and uh, Derek, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'm glad to be here, and appreciate you asking me to do this. Yeah, it's fun to, to uh, reconnect. It's been a long time uh, since we got a chance to see each other, so uh, I'm so glad that you uh, were able to do this. Um, well, as we've done with the with the last, uh, gosh, now I don't know how many episodes um, since COVID uh, started, uh, I did want to start off by asking you a little bit about that and how it's impacted uh, your practice. And, and for those listening uh, after the fact, because we're recording this uh, uh, middle of June, June 18th, um, and it won't uh, be in the feed until July. So uh, who knows where we'll be <laughs> at that point yeah. with all of this. But as of now, June 18th, um, what has been uh, going on most recently with your firm as it relates to COVID and just how you guys are working right now? Sure. So, so my firm, we, we initially, like most people back in March, uh, essentially closed the office and started working remotely for, for a few weeks. And, uh, I'd say in probably about the last two weeks, we've sort of transitioned back to business as usual. Of course, being in, I'm in Longview, a uh, town of about 80 to 90,000 people. And, and it hasn't been, uh, Longview never really completely shut down. They shut down for about two weeks, but then pretty quickly, everybody started getting back to business as usual. Okay. And so we kind of fell in with that a little bit. We're a little, so we've got, uh, you know, everybody's back in the office, uh, on a pretty regular basis now. So if, at least as far as the office goes, uh, we're, we're about back to normal or where we were before March, mm -hmm. um, case wise and stuff, there's constant, you know, things are constantly happening and changing and evolving with me with the courts or with court reporters or opposing counsel or, or even clients, you know, yeah, uh, and then just accommodating clients. And of course we, we clean the office a lot more regularly than <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> probably a few times a day, everything gets wiped down now. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise it's, it's, uh, uh, I'd say it's stay, it hasn't changed just a whole lot. It did force us to do to to go a little more electronic on some things, such as getting making sure our record keeping was was being done virtual, and and uh, and we did set up a WebEx account so that we can conduct depots and mediations or client right. interviews or that sort of thing remotely. Yeah. Uh, so it sort of sped some stuff up that we probably needed to do anyway. Sure. Sure. Yeah, uh, well, a couple things that I want to follow up on that you mentioned. Uh, one was sort of the uh, the uh, relatively short, it sounds like, time period of shutdown in Longview uh, before things kind of opened back up. Did the courts uh, track alongside that um, and local bar uh, as well as kind of the rest of the economy in Longview? Or um, did they 
continued to stay closed down when it came to hearings or, or pushing jury trials, that kind of stuff? Yeah, the courts, the courts are still, um, for the most part, shut down. They, yeah. They've, you okay. know, some hearings have been conducted using Zoom, I think, is the, the app that they've been using. So some of the judges have held hearings in that way. Yeah, uh, there's been some I think some criminal I don't do any criminal work. So this is just sort of what I know from conversations. But I think some of that has continued. We actually Greg County Bar, uh, where Longview's in Greg County yeah. the Bar yeah. Association, put together a, a continuing education seminar and had uh, the local judge who's the, the chief judge for this area. Uh, state court judge, you know, give a little presentation on where things are and, and where things are headed. Uh, so that was just a couple of weeks ago, and everybody's still trying to figure out how we'll have actual in-person jury trials to where, you know, where will we conduct uh, void ire to where we can keep the people spread out far enough and have proper screening. And, uh, and to the extent that there are live hearings, there's a lot more, um, a lot more plexiglass you know, plexiglass at the bench <laughs> sure. and yeah. plexiglass at the court reporter's table and that sort right. of thing. So right. it's still it's still fairly limited. I think even like the um, the Greg County District Clerk is is sort of an appointment only uh, option to go into their office. And the county clerk is they're still open and available, but they're running they kind of run up at a half staff so that they don't have everybody in at one time. Yeah. Uh, and they try, they're checking temperatures at the courthouse when you show up and, and uh, some of those things. So ju- jury trials have definitely not returned back to normal, even in yeah. Greg County. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. Um, well, is there anything, it sounded like you maybe done, you and or your firm had done at least a, a few maybe uh, depositions or some things on, on WebEx and, and some tools. Uh, what have you learned in that process, uh, that you could pass on in terms of just tips and, uh, things like that, uh, that you've picked up here in these, uh, these days of, of doing those by, by uh, remote, uh, and, and everything else. Yeah. One of the things I guess I, I like, if it's possible, um, you know, it's nice to be with the witness if it's yeah. at all possible, even if all the lawyers aren't. Uh, but then, you, you know, as the taking lawyer, you want to make sure that there's not something uh, untoward going on that, you know, that there's some sort of signaling of answers or coaching of the witness that's not yeah. getting picked up on the video. Uh, so that <laughs> that's kind of an issue. The uh, uh, and for the most part, lawyers have been real good about it. You know, yeah. they, uh, I think most people know who the who the lawyers are that they need to worry about on that kind of thing. Uh, you want to drop us they, the list here real quick? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you guys got to go learn that the hard way in practice. It's right? a small list. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But it, it, you got to prepare, you know, prepare ahead of time and really think through how you're going to quit question the witness and what you're going to do. Cause if it's a depot that requires exhibits, right. Uh, then you're going to have to uh, typically you, you need to get those exhibits or the potential exhibits to the court reporter uh, ahead of time. Yeah. So that she has them or he has them available to show as a PDF while you're questioning the witness. And of course, by doing that, you're in a way tipping your hand to the other lawyer. So right. uh, it makes it a little harder to hold things back if there's some surprise angle. Uh, so you kind of want to think about what you include. Uh, maybe over include exhibits just, you know, if there's some one really key item, maybe you want to disclose as say 10 potential exhibits when there's really only one that you really plan to use or care about just as a way of sort of, sort of, uh, not, not completely putting all your cards on the table until you start to ask the witness questions. Right. Uh, So that, that's the only tricky part about that. And then on the really big cases, it's still, you know, I've got uh, a couple really sizable cases and the defendants, when you're asking for enough money, they still want to see the witness in person. Right. Uh, so those have been delayed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, and uh, how have you seen uh, clients um, either uh, uh, your clients or, or maybe opposing the opposing side too? Um, how has COVID, if at all, impacted 
um, their uh, posture uh, with regards to litigation. Uh, I think we, we've spoken with others in the past who have said, you know, hey, without a deadline on on things, that, which is sort of the natural barrier to or, 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 you know, instigator towards settlement, that's kind of delaying things. But then others just have so many other fires to put out. Um, you know, that, that one more litigation, if they can get rid of it, is just one more thing off their plate. So what have you kind of seen from a client's posture standpoint? Yeah. And the clients, it, you know, it's kind of a couple ways is, is one, uh, because of the delays that you can't really do anything about. Like I just, uh, I just got an order from a federal court, you know, a general order that came out delaying jury trials past July 31 of 2020, continuing every. And so clients are very, for the most part, have been understanding when you call them and say, look, we thought we were going to be going to trial and we'd get your case wrapped up one way or the other this month, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so for the most part, those, those kind of clients, you know, have been pretty understanding about that, though. I'm sure there's, there's some frustration because it's, it takes a while, as you know, to get to the, to the jury trial well, stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, uh, you know, the insurance adjusters and the and opposing parties kind of kind of run the gamut. There have been a couple of them I've dealt with that see this as an opportunity to hurry up and get a case resolved now so that when everything does open up, they don't have a bazillion cases to deal with. Right. Uh, and then there have been others who who are just kind of using it as an excuse, I think, to to kind of put things off and say, oh, well, we're running on half staff. We need more time to respond to your demand or, or whatever. Uh, so those kind of things vary. And then the clients, it's kind of funny watching them come in and out of the offices. One, I think people are a lot less likely to actually come in person than sure. they once were. Uh, they're a lot more, yeah, a lot quicker to call. Uh, but we still get, you know, you get some clients who, uh, uh, come in that are, that are, uh, uh, of a mindset that they're not going to, wear a mask and, and the the concerns are either overblown or government oppression. And so they try and act like there's, there's nothing wrong. Uh, whereas, and then you've got others who, and, and I'd say the majority of them when they come in now are probably wearing masks themselves mm-hmm. and, and yeah. a little more cognizant of it. You know, you, you quickly learn to read people as to whether or not they're comfortable you know, do they want to shake hands? Shake do, they hands want to or... bump? do they want to elbow bump? <laughs> the elbow thing. <laughs> yeah. Wave from across the room. You yep. Know? Uh, yep. but kind of get a, get a pretty good variety of that from clients, yeah. but, but definitely I, I wouldn't say half, but maybe a third of them, you know, are wearing masks now and, and, you know, just wave as opposed to shaking hands. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and as you know, in a service industry, like we are, you, you just kind of read people and accommodate them as do what makes them the most comfortable. Right. Uh, but yeah, you do have to kind of lay down, lay down the ground rules if you're not comfortable. Yeah. You know, shaking hands, just let them know, and uh, and they can take it or leave it. Most people are understanding. They might they might not agree, but they'll say that's fine. And uh, if you didn't want to shake hands or something, I'm I'm more of a mind that I don't. Yeah, I don't I don't get too concerned about it. So I'll just whatever makes the client most comfortable right. is what I'm fine with. And. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to move past this. Although, as we sit here, as I said earlier, June 18th, our, our Texas cases are rising uh, more quickly than they're falling. And so who knows uh, kind of what it'll look like in the next couple of months. But well, thanks for sharing that uh, as it relates to COVID. Um, but I do want to hear, and, and our, our audience wants to hear more uh, about your practice. Uh, they've maybe picked up on it from the way you've described a couple of the things that we've already sure. talked about. But but talk about your firm, and it's still, I would say, relatively uh, – new venture young firm for you and uh yeah uh, so tell us about that and how everything's going yeah so we started dan sorry john hole and myself started our own firm launched it at the very beginning of january of this year and uh and we do client or uh, plaintiff side plaintiff side civil litigation really from uh, of a wide variety to two big focus areas of course are personal injury and intellectual property i'm a patent attorney and, and have done a lot of uh, patent related lawsuits. And, yeah. and so those are kind of our two biggest areas. My one partner, Dan, has a, a really good niche with nursing home cases that he's real good with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so everything we do involves yeah, either it involves the threat of a lawsuit or an actual lawsuit. And most things become a lawsuit, which which that typically involves a whole lot of human interaction, you know, unlike, uh, say, unlike a real estate closing where we could just send paperwork back and forth. Right. Uh, so that's where the, the whole COVID 
uh, and especially the shutdown for a month or so really kind of made things a little uh, little nerve wracking. Everybody was kind of worried are the defendants and insurance companies. So they just yeah. going to use this as a reason to do nothing for six months. Yeah. And uh, and so they, some have, some haven't. Uh, but that's what we do. So we're in court. We've got cases in, in federal and state court across the state. Uh, and a couple out of state cases as well. So we get to see a pretty, pretty wide variety of reaction to it. Like I've got a, a case, uh, it's in federal court in Waco. Uh, and oh, okay. the lawyers, you know, yeah, some of the lawyers I'm working with are in Boston and some of them are in Los Angeles. And those areas are completely locked down or have right. been. And so that's made it kind of interesting is orchestrating how to have hearings and when. And, you know, and the courts, courts have been pretty accommodating. Hey, we've had a couple of telephonic hearings. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and then compared to like Greg County, the courts are having trouble figuring out how to have a jury trial. But depositions have continued. You know, lawyers are still traveling. Clients are traveling. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so our practice is all plaintiff side. It's all uh, almost all contingency based yeah. uh, litigation. So uh, and, and then always typically representing the aggrieved party, the injured party, either financially or physically. Right. Right. And, and to uh, and to just add another layer of context uh, for people that aren't familiar with with you or your firm, uh, you are uh, are a seasoned uh, veteran at this and you have done this for a long time with lots of success before launching into your your own That's firm right. with those guys more recently. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, got, I was licensed in 98. So I've been at it for this year will be 22 years that I've been licensed and was an engineer before that. So I was not exactly a young you know, a brand new young lawyer when I started, yeah. uh, but, but we've all had a bunch of individual success and the timing was right. And I'd always yeah. wanted to, to, to start my own firm with some friends. And so this is, this worked out real well. Wow. Yeah. I think uh, the, the youngest one of us has been licensed for 15 years now. So we've been combined experiences pretty deep. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. And I, uh, and I did get a chance, uh, uh, was it last fall, I guess, or, or late oh, right. summer fall to come and check out your new offices and, and, and everything you had going. So it's really neat, right. uh, uh, really neat office. Well, um, so is there anything going on in, um, in, in the, those, especially those, uh, two, uh, areas that you personally practice in and, and personal injury and also the intellectual property side of things, um, anything going on just within those practice areas, either from a, a, a law standpoint or a legislative standpoint, um, that is changing or new or just something types of cases that are coming up right now. Uh, what's going on in, in the area? Like if you go to a CLE on some of these things, what are going to be the hot topics? Well, uh, one of the hot topics, at least, uh, with two of them that immediately come to mind and they all kind of tie back to the coronavirus as well. Mm. But one of them is, um, uh, and I have yet to see any of these cases. I've just heard a few people speak about it and seen lots of CLE topics on business interruption insurance. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, that's that's become a real hot topic. Now, how, whether that'll evolve into a bunch of cases where essentially insurance companies are refusing to pay uh, on business interruption policies, you know, when companies had to shut down because the government told them to and they lost revenue. Um, you know, then that's that's the dispute. We'll, so we'll see if that winds up becoming a hot area. I think a lot of people are anticipating it, that it is and a lot right. of uh, uh, pretty smart lawyers and, and law firms are all anticipating it and, and looking yeah. for those kinds of cases. Um, and then the other one is, is you know, what is the legislature going to do? What sort of uh, uh, and, and no specific bill comes to mind. I just seem to recall having seen some headlines about different pieces of legislation that may have uh, some sort of immunity riders getting trying to get squeezed into them to protect yeah. companies from, from liability and right. you know, the, you know, the ostensibly to protect them from liability from something like COVID-19, but yeah. potentially going well beyond that. So right, right. Uh, it, it, that'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. And that's kind of from a plaintiff side, that's, that's areas where yeah. like the Texas Trial Lawyers Association <laughs> and the American Association for Justice are real helpful to, to stay abreast of that information. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I'd definitely be following that. Um, and, and one other thing I wanted to touch on with your firm and practice is uh, I think you're the first, I'm pretty sure, um, that uh, we've had from uh, East Texas, from Longview, for sure. Uh, uh -huh. Tell us just what it's like uh, practicing in Longview for those that aren't familiar or 
uh, I'd just love for you to take a few minutes and, and champion uh, uh, Longview for a minute. Sure, sure. So I've I've been, you know, I started my career in uh, in Austin, yeah. of all places, and then was in uh, Waco for a little while uh, after that for about 10 years, and then, and then moved to Longview. And personally, I think there's a lot of benefits to being in a community the size of Longview, which, which is similar to Waco. Yeah. Uh, the Waco has yep. been growing like crazy <laughs> lately. Uh, but it's, it's a town of about 80,000, uh, you know, the main high schools are six, a high school. So it's a good size high school. Yeah. Uh, the, the legal community is small enough that you know everybody, which which I think works as a bit of a check on people playing games with each other, right. you know, because because you're going to cross paths time and again, whether yeah. whether professionally or socially. So everybody tends to be be pretty straightforward and reliable mm-hmm. when they tell you they're going to do something. Uh, and it's a it's a, a great quality of life too. You know, you you can like I can get off of work and be back at my house in five minutes, uh, <laughs> right. or or if the kids have something going on, you know, it's pretty easy to make it out, get off work or get done with what I'm doing and get to watch one of my kids play sports or whatever else they're doing uh, or or stuff that I want to do. If I want to get to the gym or, or go to the lake, you know, they're all with you've got yeah, lakes within 20 minutes of, of going to play on uh, kind of like the same with Waco. You've got, you know, the bodies of water around there for recreation yeah. that are real close. So I like it. I think it's a it's a great quality of life. Uh, and a really, it's a really good legal community in, in East Texas, especially. It's, I, I don't know what it is about it, but there's a lot of really good lawyers. There's, uh, uh, it's fairly densely populated, and, and the, uh, the federal courts are not overburdened with a huge criminal docket, so your, your civil cases in federal court can move pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, so, so that makes it kind of nice. Yeah. 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 Well, no, that, that's great. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I kind of chuckled when you mentioned the five minute commute as I'm sure a lot of people right. listening to this that practice in Dallas or Houston or Austin are, are listening to at least one, if not two of these episodes in one commute. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so uh, yeah. don't feel bad, everybody. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it's okay. Uh, we're here to keep you company on this, on that extra commute that you have. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, what um, I want to ask you about uh, associates and uh, as a, a lot of the, uh, most of the folks listening to this are, are young lawyers, associates, um, and, and you've certainly had uh, a fair share that have worked with you and for you over the years, different points and different firms. Um, what, what's uh, what's something that you think is is really critical uh, for a young lawyer to uh, to adopt as part of their practice to be successful and to impress the, uh, the, the partners, the senior associates, those in the firm. Gotcha. I think, um, you know, two things come to mind on that is, is one, uh, having a positive attitude mm, you know, yeah. that, and whether it's, whether it's practice in law or just your family life, you know, trying to find the, uh, the bright side of things I think is always helpful and, and it helps keep a, yeah, just having a positive attitude can make a great impression on other people, uh, as well as help you keep moving forward on on days that are going to be rough. Because everybody's going to have rough days practicing law, no matter or, or any profession for that matter. But but trying to find the bright side of things can help get past those and and remember why you keep coming back to it or why you went to law school in the first place. And then the other one is is uh, being being very self motivated. Yeah, to me, to me, there's nothing worse than somebody who finishes a task and and uh, and then they just kind of sit there checking email or hanging out doing nothing when there's plenty of work to be done. All they've got to do is get up and go find it. Right. Uh, and so making sure you stay busy and if you have downtime or you have space in your schedule, go find somebody and figure out how you can help them get something done on a case or, or take a little bit of work off of them so they can focus on something uh, that maybe they can do that you can't just because of the experience level. So yeah. being, being very self-motivated and having a good attitude are two really, uh, things that I value highly in an associate. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I'm trying to remember, we may have touched on it once on this show. It would have been a while back though. I think, um, as you're talking about that, uh, specifically around that self-motivated example of, you know, when you're done with something, um, not just sitting back, but going and finding the work. Um, I, uh, I distinctly remember more than one conversation, uh, with 
uh, partners in law firms who uh, let go of lawyers who were very capable, very smart, did good work when it was asked of them, um, but were never um, you know, doing more than they were asked to do, were never getting up like you were just describing after they were finished with something and going to ask for more work. Um, and, uh, over time, uh, it was a large, a little bit larger firm, but people just didn't know them that well. Um, and then, and there just wasn't enough of their product out there. We're probably for people to see it. And, and that, that came back to that self-motivation and, and it's happened on more than one occasion. I've had those conversations with, with lawyers, which, uh, I think for maybe younger lawyers, uh, may not be intuitive, um, that that would be a problem and that would, they would expect that work would always just be assigned um, and people would just sort of keep your, your inbox full of work to do. And that's not always the case, is it? That's right. That's right. And especially, you know, as uh, uh, say as a senior partner or a partner in a firm with associates, you've got a lot of things that you're worried about, you know, from, from business development to, to actual legal research. And so if, you know, a lot of times I'll be head down in something that I'm trying to get done and I don't have time or won't take the time to stop and think, okay, what could I give to the associate to do that would free me up? Whereas if the, if an associate were to come in and interrupt me and say, hey, uh, what do you got that I can help you with? Then I'll stop and I'll figure out, okay, well, you really could help me on this. Where yeah. If they don't ask, I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to be right. trying to get get it done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's a huge thing is to just constantly be thinking how you can help somebody out so you can stay busy and be a productive member of the team. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, what's, um, what's something that's a, a red flag, you know, when, if an associate's doing something that, that you just, uh, you, you see and, and you're like, Oh, we need to have a talk about this or this isn't going to work out. What, what are some, some key red flags to avoid? You know, the, the biggest, I guess the biggest one for me uh, and kind of a pet peeve as much as anything is, um, uh, is a lack of, uh, I think of it as a lack of follow up or, or failure to close the loop. Like you ask an associate to say, uh, you know, track down a witness or, or, or get something done and they'll say, well, I did this and then I sent an email, uh, or I left a voicemail and then they just sit back and wait. Hmm. Uh, that, that, especially the email part of it where somebody just sends an email. Mm-hmm. Well, if you didn't pick up the phone or you didn't get an email confirmation that the other person's received it and working on it, you don't know if that email ever went anywhere or not. You don't right. know if the other side's actually doing their job. But, so making sure people close the loop and, uh, and even by telephone, you know, leaving a voicemail doesn't mean the person on the other end is actually going to do a damn thing. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, you got to follow up and make sure that that uh, that it's being done. And if and if uh, like you leave that voicemail for opposing counsel to, and you, you need an answer back, you know, call them today, call them tomorrow, call them the next day, call them twice a day, become that squeaky wheel that gets it taken care of. And if somebody's not doing that, it's kind of a big red flag. If somebody says, well, I left a voicemail or, well, I left an email or I sent a text and I'm just waiting to hear back. That's a problem. I think, yeah, that can become a problem. It's not always a problem, but, but if it happens repeatedly, it, it's a problem. Yeah. And, and I would say too, um, there, there is a, and, and I would include myself, uh, in this, uh, generation, probably uh, I might be the oldest part of this, um, on down in terms of, uh, age, but that, uh, you know, we've just gotten so accustomed to communicating so much by text, whether that's uh-huh. an email or text message or some other type of thing where we don't have to get on the phone <laughs> and talk to someone that when something, and, and oftentimes, like you're saying, it does require that within the law practice to get on the phone. A lot of us, I feel like, and especially those uh, that are probably listening to this, just don't have an, that much experience talking on the phone. <laughs> like, right, just don't right. do it that much uh, and try to avoid it because it's not, not comfortable. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's something they got to you know, get over and, 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 and do, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it, it's funny you say that because it seems like the younger the younger associates that I've worked with uh, really picking up the phone and calling somebody is like the last thing they want to do or the last sure. thing they think about doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then it's, and, and you can't, I mean, you can kind of close the loop or follow up by email, but you just got to make sure you get a response. Yeah. You know, yeah. Right. I think about it kind of like just, you, you know, it's sort of like they did their part and then they threw it over the fence and they hope something's being done on the other <laughs> side of the fence. Right. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah. And, and it's like a, there's a whole generation that could really learn the value of a phone call. Of a phone call. Uh, yeah. 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 For sure. Make sure it gets done. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, um, uh, maybe the last topic is we're, we're uh, starting to wind down our time is, is hiring. And, and I do want to ask you about that. We've worked together over the years as you've hired folks at different places. Um, uh -huh. what are one or two things that you, uh, really prioritize and look for when you're, when you're hiring, um, a, a new associate and, and, you know, most of the people listening to this are, are out practicing a little bit, so they might be lateral hire types. And, and so anything specific to that, uh, but just in general as well, what, what are some key things that you look for? Yeah, so um, of course you always want to see people who've who've got good grades and and have had some prior success, whether it's in grades or or work cases they've worked yeah. on. Uh, and then again, just something to indicate that this person really is a, a self starter that they'll they'll find things to do, and if there's nothing to do in the firm, they'll figure out something to do that benefits the rest of the team. Yeah. Uh, and and a lot of times you can pick up on that. You can pick up on that a little bit from from what's on the resume, like the, the, what somebody's hobbies are, and, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose, or extracurricular type activities. Are they are they someone who seems to stay pretty busy, or do they just just do what you know their work and they're done? Yeah. Um, you know, and then and then you can pick up on that just kind of in an interview with some questions about you know how they've handled different situations. I think and and right. They, come across as somebody that understands that this is a team effort. They've got to, they've got to always be looking for some way to help, help advance cases or help, help clients out or help improve the firm standing, you know, in the community, then uh, you can pick up on that in an interview. But as long as they're, they're motivated to do those things, that's a, that's a real big plus in my mind. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, in the, in the interviews, are, are there things that are, um, red flags that pop up, uh, or, or have you, uh, experienced some, uh, some interesting, uh, horror stories with interviews where candidates just kind of, unfortunately, uh, blew it for some reason. You know, I've, I can't think of ones where there was any key thing that just blew it. I think, you know, yeah. kind of for me, sort of pet peeves are, are, uh, when you're interviewing somebody and, and they're, they're kind of, uh, they have no, uh, self-awareness where, where they're talking and, and, they may be yammering on, but they don't have the presence of mind to realize that, you know, they've been talking for 15 minutes and they've not engaged in a conversation yeah. uh, or, or they don't realize that what they're saying, you know, they have a hard time seeing themselves or how, what they're saying would be perceived. Right. And then, uh, and then can interviews where, where it's completely one-sided, I mean, you do have to, you expect the, the person to talk about themselves in an interview and you want that. Uh, but I, I, it's a pet peeve of mine when all they want to do is tell you about themselves. And, and, uh, and I have had some where, where, uh, you know, some, some interviews where somebody was, you know, talking about themselves to the point they were bragging about something, uh, that I was thinking, you know, I've done a whole lot more in that area than, than whatever you're talking about or, or, or what you're bragging about. And, and you would hope you'd at least have done your homework to know, you know, that I have tried that type of case or I have, you know, done this or that. Uh, so when it, yeah, when, it, when it's a self-centered person telling you all about themselves and then on top of that, it becomes obvious that they didn't find out anything about you before they walked in the interview, that uh, can really right. turn, turn me off. You know, I expect somebody to at least have, Googled my name and read a bio or two on me before they come in to sit for an interview. Yeah. 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 I mean, you kind of hit on two key things there between the, um, self-awareness and, and the importance of engaging in a conversation within the interview rather than just having a 30 or 40 minute monologue about yourself, but then right. also the preparation, yeah. uh, yeah. that, uh, is required to, to do well in an interview and knowing who you're talking with, knowing your audience, um, is really important and asking questions, learning about the, 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 the person on the other side of the, of the conversation. Those, those are things that are, are really important and sometimes get forgotten. Uh, yeah. when people are trying to just kind of showcase what they think is, is the best of themselves. Right. Right. And maybe in some interviews that works for them, but it doesn't. Yeah. I figure if they, if they haven't taken the time to do a little research before they come into the interview, how much research will they do for a client or a case? Yeah. That's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. You know, and I, I look, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, I think that's a very common way for people in a hiring position to look at things like interviews, as well as look at things like resumes. I was having a conversation recently with, uh, someone who, a candidate who was clearly very qualified, strong, all that, but their resume had a fairly significant 
uh, error uh, in it mm. that was pretty noticeable. Um, and the the person just said, "Look, you know, if 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 she's applying for a job, it's it's not, you know, willing to take the time to." you know, make sure the resume doesn't have an error like this in it or right. any errors for that matter in a one page resume. What are they yeah. going to do when it's a, a, a client project uh, that I give them? Um, and that's the way that translates. <laughs> and yeah. so yeah. It, it's it, tough. <laughs> it's a whole lot easier to say no to an interviewer than to say yes. And so whenever you do something like that, an error in the resume, you just give somebody an easy way to say no. Right, yeah. right, right, right. No, absolutely. Um, well, um, and, and to leave that on a positive note for people rather than a negative, uh, there are uh, a lot of resumes that have those problems. And so if you do take the time to make sure that your resume uh, is is perfect from a grammatical standpoint and a, and a, a formatting standpoint and all of those things, um, cover letters, the same kind of thing. You already are well above a lot of people that may actually be otherwise better qualified, but you've leaped over them because right. you've just done the right things with your couple of documents. So they're, they're, we'll leave it on that high note. <laughs> There you go. They're an easy, it's an easy fix. It's That's easy. right. Everybody right. has someone that can look it over for them and That's give them right. some feedback. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, um, is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you'd feel like you'd want to share uh, with, with the audience that, that you think is important? You know, I, I, um, off the top of my head, I can't really think uh, of anything that we haven't touched on. Again, the older I've gotten, the more I've decided that having a positive attitude is, is yeah. really important. So, uh, 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 that's that I would, uh, uh, just say, you know, I, I don't think I can emphasize that enough. Uh, and then perseverance. I had my very first job, my, my boss, uh, it was as an engineer and my boss gave me a task and he said, don't take no for an answer. He said, when someone tells you they'll have somebody call you back, don't let them do that. Make them stay on the phone till they get somebody on the phone that can answer mm. your question. Yeah. And, uh, it doesn't always work that way, but having that kind of pushiness can get a lot of things done. And you can do it with a positive attitude or with a polite attitude, but, right. but you can do it. Yeah. And it'll, it'll add up over time. You know, there's, uh, the, 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 there was, I read Warren Buffett's biography recently called Snowball. And, and the point he makes in there is, you know, it's, it's small efforts over a lifetime that add up to something really big. And the same goes for the practice of law. Uh, so just little things and stay at it. Yeah. Well, well, awesome. Well, uh, Derek, thank you so much for taking the time. We've got our, uh, rapid fire questions to ah, end this thing. Okay. So if okay. you're ready, we'll fire away with those. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. All right. Name one trait or characteristic you most want to see in an associate. Uh, I would say ambition. Somebody cool. that's pretty ambitious. Yeah. What habit has been key to your success? Uh, well, along those lines, persistence, just being, being persistent on things. Yeah. yeah. Your favorite app or productivity tool. Oh, um, there's one that I've used for a long time now called good reader. Good reader. Uh, one, one word. Yeah. And a good reader allows me to carry around, you know, a couple dozen, uh, uh, deposition transcripts as well as cases and briefs and everything else on an iPad and highlight it and annotate it and all yeah. that. So that's probably my favorite one. Awesome. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes for sure. So people can, can link to it and find it. Uh, you your favorite social distancing activity. Uh, uh, probably. Well, we spent some time at the lake, so I'd say wakeboarding out at the lake. Yeah. There you go. That's a yeah. good one for sure. And then your favorite legal movie. Oh, without question, my cousin, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down the best. Yeah. It's a, it's a great one. Uh, yeah. and, uh, one of our favorites here at the show, we've already done a deep dive into it cause it oh, was, good. it's, it's one of our all time favorites. So, uh, yeah, a good selection there. Not, not only is it funny, but it's all legally accurate. That's, you know, is the best yeah. part about it. Yeah. 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 We've talked about that and, and, the, and how a lot of, uh, faculty use, uh, the movie to, to do yeah. illustrate different points and how accurate, yeah, the, it is relative to the law and, and the procedural issues and, and things right. like that. Um, so, uh, absolutely good stuff. Well, Derek, thank you again. Uh, it's great to see you and, and have you on the show. Really appreciate you spending time with us. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, Daniel. All right. My thanks again to Derek Gilliland for joining us on the show today. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider doing two things for me? Would you subscribe so you don't miss an episode? And then would you please go and rate and review the podcast in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you have suggestions or thoughts 
about the show or if I could help you in any way, please email me directly, daniel at varsitysearch.com. You can also email me if you or someone you know might have interest in a family law associate attorney position that we mentioned earlier. It is located in Arlington. Again, two plus years of family law experience. Uh, We would love to hear from you. So you can email me or you can go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers and you can find the job at the bottom of the page there for more information and to apply. All right, that's it for today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Thanks again so much to each of you for listening. I'm Daniel Hare with Varsity Search and we'll talk with you next time. We'll be right back.